Hi everyone, my name is Bridget Chase and I am the Community Success Specialist for First Voices. Hi everyone, my name is Kira Fortier and I'm the Language Technology Programs Coordinator at First Peoples Cultural Council. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt. Bridget is calling in from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. We recognize it is our privilege and not our right to be here. And we hold up our hands to the traditional custodians of the land and thank them for all their hard work and spirit that propels FPCC's work forward. A quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to introduce you to FPCC and First Voices. We're then going to talk about the meat and potatoes of our presentation, which is an overview of our networks of support. We're then going to talk about trends and themes and key takeaways from our research. So to give you a bit of background on FPCC, we are a First Nations directed crown agency. This means that we are directed by a board of Indigenous community members and we take our teachings from them to implement our grant and training programs in the areas of language, arts, culture and heritage. We serve 204 First Nations communities. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that BC is unique in the world in that it has a high density of language families. We have 34 languages in British Columbia and many dialects within. Um, therefore, it is important for us to consider the diversity of the people that we serve when doing our work. Um, because of this important relationship, we are very careful in how we take a community development approach to our work. This means that we create accessible materials, we engage in a supportive delivery process, we are passionate about providing applicant technical support and constructive follow-up, and all grants are put through an adjudication committee made up of First Nations community members, and we consider this and strive to be an open and equitable process. So one part of the First Peoples Cultural Council is First Voices. So First Voices is a suite of web-based tools and services that were designed to support Indigenous communities engaged with language archiving, language teaching, and culture revitalization. It was initially launched in 2003, with the 2.0 version of the platform being launched in 2018. And it's totally open source and free for communities uh, located within British Columbia to use. Uh, it is an ad advanced data management system specifically tailored for language work and most importantly all of the data that's uploaded onto First Voices by communities is owned by those communities. The tools encompassed by First Voices is firstvoices.com which is the language site where communities can upload their content. Then there's also First Voices apps which pull the content from the sites and uh, create mobile apps for iOS as well as Android. And then there's the First Voices keyboards, which were developed using a keyboard development software called Keyman and are available again for mobile as well as other digital devices, including Mac and Windows computers. So on to today's topic, the paper that we've written describes and examines the components in the process of establishing and growing our training and technical support program. Through our analysis, we hope to show that three primary themes run through our interactions with First Voices users and contributors. These three themes are keyboards as a technical focus, the desire for personalized and hands-on technical instruction, and the importance and efficacy of multimodal approaches to building relationships and delivering support. This section will give an overview and analysis that supports these findings. Um, this section also contains several tables and figures uh, that have some detailed data on them. So if you hope to read those in more detail, we encourage you to pause the video and take a second to read them. The three networks of support that we employ are our service desk, which is a tech support resource, our knowledge base, a training and self-study resource, and our training program, which is typically delivered through regional training sessions. Bridget is going to start us off by talking about our service desk. Yeah, so Service Desk is a portal uh, that allows for users to email either help at fpcc.ca or hello at firstvoices.com. And all of those incoming support emails are filtered through a queue uh, where we can track, triage, and assign incoming requests to a First Voices staff member. This system was launched for us in June of 2018. And uh, not only are we able to group requests together that come in and categorize them, but then we actually are are able to create tickets that outline changes or fixes that need to be made by our development team uh, if bugs are reported as an example or features are requested. 
And so uh, over the course of almost two years, between June of 2018 and November of 2020, just over a thousand tickets came in through our system. Uh, for the purpose of this analysis, we removed uh, over 250 of them that were marked as spam. And then the remaining 752 tickets were then coded and categorized using a variety of labels that can be found at the table on the slide. For the sake of this research, we then actually parsed out the tickets that were labeled as first voices specific in order to summarize the key takeaways uh, that would be most relevant for you folks today. And so starting with tickets labeled as technical support tickets, um, the primary topics that people were sending in were, were related to software and hardware questions. 11% uh, of the tickets surveyed here were related specifically to audio recording with audacity being a very common theme. And 18.5% of the tickets had to do with hardware. Usually questions about what types of computers a community team should purchase, how to use specific SD cards, and the difference between different Zoom branded microphones. Now it is important to note that people requesting information about Audacity as well as about Zoom brand microphones does make sense because this is the software and hardware uh, that we recommend and we generally train people on here at First Voices. Next, for tickets that uh, were labeled as app support, uh, there were primarily questions about if specific apps exist, where they can download apps, and if an app doesn't exist, uh, if First Voices could develop one for them. Mobile apps have become an increasingly popular tech tool, and so it's not surprising to see people interested in this topic. Then we had keyboard support tickets. So the majority of questions that were labeled with keyboard support related to finding, downloading, and installing specific language keyboards. There were many folks who had emailed us looking for hands-on technical support in getting a keyboard set up on their device. And the rest of the tickets generally were questions about how to use keyboards or how to update them, as well as reports of bugs. So this could be things like a broken keyboard, uh, if a keyboard was missing specific characters, or if the characters were incorrect. One interesting statistic that we found within this subsection of tickets was a discrepancy in the terminology that was used. So while 76% of the tickets that were asking about keyboards used the word keyboard, 19% actually used the word font instead in place of the word keyboard. Uh, the remaining percentage didn't use any word at all, and they just instead explained that they wanted to type in their language. One other interesting finding of note was that actually when we were analyzing the various tickets that had come through Service Desk, we were surprised to find that very few of them were feature requests. And after looking at all of the different networks of support that we used, we found that while Service Desk was often used to report problems or to request for support, um, feature requests and ideas and suggestions usually came through things like in-person calls, uh, group meetings, discussions, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The second tool that we analyzed was our knowledge base. It was launched at the end of May in 2018, and uh, it can be found at wiki.firstvoices.com. It's by no means a static site. It's constantly being updated, added to, and changed. And we also use this wiki to run a development updates blog where new features, bug fixes, and other website and app upgrades can be shared. So when analyzing the knowledge base, we looked at the current active content pages. There are 54 pages currently available to the public. And these 54 pages have over 5,300 total page views with over 3,500 of them being unique. The average visit to the knowledge base lasts just under seven minutes. And it's also important to note that within these active content pages, five pages were created specifically to host the 2020 Digital First Voices training content. These five pages alone make up almost a fourth of the total knowledge base page views. And interestingly enough, 23% of those training content page views came after training was already over. This really showed us that creating training resources that are static, easy to find, and digitally accessible at any point in time does draw users back into the content even once training sessions are complete. Now, for the sake of this analysis, we also uh, used the labels that we use in the service desk section to code topics of various pages and uh, pull out these sort of broad knowledge purpose pages to analyze for you today. So pages that were labeled with technical support, language support, and general purpose uh, were analyzed as well. And these are the pages that aren't first voices specific. 
Um, these had a collective 1,219 page views. And in the chart on the slide, we showcase the top 10 pages here. You can see some clear trends that really align with our service desk analysis. So topics like keyboards, audio recording, and tech setups were all quite popular. Now let's talk about training. The way that we deliver training has evolved over the years as we learn from communities uh, what they need and how we can best serve them. Uh, the knowledge that communities generously share with us through this process is invaluable, and in this way it's important to note that the learning experience is very much reciprocal. Sure, we offer instruction on certain skills, but we also gain a better understanding of communities' needs that allows us to engage in a responsive development process for First Voices tools. There are two main components to training, uh, regional sessions and monthly webinars. Regional sessions allow us to gather in large groups, not anymore, uh, in central areas throughout the province. This supports networking and peer-to-peer -peer learning by providing communities from related languages to work with and learn from one another. Training sessions in 2020 were of course held online and this provided new opportunities for us to learn how to address contributors' needs when learning how to use First Voices and adapt it to their community's projects. This underscores our engagement in the training process as an important impetus for resource development. So you can see how these networks of support are feeding into one another. So how did we analyze the training responses um, and the feedback from folks? Well, at training, we distribute surveys um, and with those contain both closed and open questions. We're also going to talk about our webinar attendance as we feel there's some insight to be gained there as well. From the closed questions in our training surveys, um, we found that the most important observation was the agreement score for the last statement on this table. It's important to note that before training sessions, most of the participants are completely unfamiliar with the trainer. The average agreement score for whether a participant would be comfortable asking the trainer for help after training was 4.8 out of five. And this indicates that training sessions are a great opportunity for us to really bond with the folks that we're working with and for us to make sure that that relationship is going to continue after the training session is over. When looking at the open questions in our training survey, we used an inductive manual coding method to tease apart the themes of participants' points of feedback. 61% of the responses directly addressed training content, and of those, more than half were positive responses. 15% of the overall responses were requests for more training, and on the next slide, we see that 52% of responses overall were positive responses to hands-on practice with tech. Those who requested additional training requested more advanced tech instruction and increased hands-on practice. This echoes much of what Bridget discussed earlier, and we will touch on this in our conclusion as well. Talking about webinar attendance, um, you see that there's a huge range in attendance numbers, which we feel largely correlates to the topic of the session. Webinar attendance figures show that our top three most attended sessions, two were administrative in nature, which doesn't relate to the topic at hand today. Um, and other than that, the most attended session that focused on skill building was the session we held on alphabets and keyboards. This relates to Bridget's service desk findings as well. Yeah, so looking at these three different networks of support that we use, we did find a number of trends within questions and topics, as well as themes that uh, kind of traversed all of the different mediums. And we've co condensed these findings into three key takeaways. So our first takeaway is that keyboards are becoming an increasingly popular trend and technical focus in language documentation. Um, in support requests that were sent to our service desk, as well as analytics from our knowledge base, we are seeing the topic of keyboards becoming increasingly popular, whether you know people are using their indigenous languages on social media, whether they're using in text messaging, or for documentation purposes like on First Voices, questions about where and how keyboards can be accessed, installed, and used are becoming more and more pertinent while there are many keyboards available for Indigenous languages online, um, whether they be First Voices keyboards or otherwise, the documentation does vary. Finding keyboards can be really complex depending on what users search for. So as an example, if a keyboard is labeled with a particular anglicized spelling of the language name, it may not be obvious which keyboard a community member should use. Additionally, the process of installing a keyboard uh, and even typing on one can differ depending on what device or operating system the user is on. And people who do not currently possess a high level of technical knowledge might not be aware of how to resolve differences in instructions that aren't made out to be very clear. 
And then on a similar note, there is that interesting discrepancy that occurs within both service desk questions as well as anecdotally uh, with the difference in terminology between keyboards and fonts or some variation of typing in my language. Um, as using indigenous language keyboards becomes increasingly more commonplace, it is crucial that this difference in terminology also becomes commonplace and the distinction between the two tools, keyboards and fonts, is clear within guides, instructions, and other documentation. So our second key takeaway is that personalized technical instruction is a necessity. Um, it's obvious across all of our different networks of support that the technical instruction we provide is essential. And while the frequency of technical technical questions is high due to the nature of first voices, there is something to be said about the consistent themes that many of these questions have. You know, within service desk questions marked as technical support. Uh, people are not only asking for advice, but often also asking for further instruction. And this theme continues within training with 52% of content related feedback indicating a positive response with hands on practice to te with technology and 8.5% of responses containing a request for more hands on training. We really do believe that providing communities with personalized hands on technical support and advice and support that is unique to their teams, their foundations of knowledge and their languages is really vital in empowering communities to successfully mobilize technology for language revitalization purposes. And then the last key takeaway is that multimodal approaches are important. Uh, regarding hands on instruction and practice, you know, all of these points showcase the obvious need to build relationships above all else. Um, and we have a range of mediums that we use for our networks of support, which primarily differ in how much one to one interaction is required. You know, on one hand, we have knowledge base, which is a reliable, permanently available resource that requires no interaction between contributors and the First Voices staff, where we also have service desk, which allows for a sort of on demand interaction. And then lastly, we have training and webinars, and it's in these one on one small group or large group sessions where the relationship building opportunities really stem from. These are three very different environments that allow foundational connections to be made between our staff, the communities we work with, and the technology that we all use. And it's really important to note that all of these resources would not be effective on their own. All of the networks that we use feed into one another, and the takeaways that we learn from one network are then used to improve the rest, and they're ultimately used to improve the First Voices platform as well. So to wrap everything up today, we have three underlying points that we'd like to offer you to take forward as we feel that they uh, relate well to the existing body of literature and may inform future research. Firstly, as supported by existing literature on the subject, we feel that responsive development leads to increased community engagement for end users. We hope to be able to study the outcomes of our initiatives more closely in the future to provide data to support this. Secondly, as has been asserted by many authors before us, technology programs must be scaffolded by knowledge resources. This promotes contribution and engagement from communities and allows our relationship to be truly recipro reciprocal. And allows our relationship to be truly reciprocal. This relates as well to our last point, which is that reciprocal relationships enrich the work and the success of First Voices tools. If you have questions about our programs or the work that we've presented here today, you can check out our websites or you can email us directly and we'd be happy to connect with you. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.